So as you can see, I'm still on vacation mode. I've ditched the blazer for a linen shirt because it's hot where I'm at. Uh, today, I'm gonna talk about expatriation tax filing requirements. So you guys know I've done a lot of videos on expatriation, but mostly we've been talking about how to expatriate, the tax consequences of expatriation, how to plan your expatriation, but we haven't talked a lot about what the actual tax filing requirements are when you expatriate. It's a question that I get a lot. It's a question that I get a lot right now because there are a lot of people trying to expatriate. People are wealthy. People are scared to death of Biden's tax plan and they are getting the hell out. And so I've been talking to a lot of people about expatriation lately. And one of the big questions are, what are my actual tax obligations once I do expatriate both for my expatriation and in the subsequent years after I'm an expatriate. So that's what we're going to talk about today. But before we talk about that, as always, a little CYA disclaimer. This presentation is prepared for education purposes only. This presentation is not legal or tax advice, nor is it to be construed as such. Each individual circumstances are different. You should seek legal and or tax advice to address any specific questions you may have. All right, let's get into it. So first and foremost, we're gonna talk about Form W-8-B-E-N. Form W-8-B-E-N is a Certificate of Foreign Status of Beneficial Owner for United States Tax Withholding and Reporting. So as a U.S. citizen, or at least a U.S. resident, I'm sure you're familiar with Form W-9, right? You usually have to give this to your bank. If you have somebody renting a property from you, you have to give it to the renter. Uh, you need to give it to various payers of income to you, right? And this is to, one, give them your social security number, but two, and perhaps more importantly, to certify that you're a U.S. person. So this is basically the equivalent of a W-9 for non-resident aliens, right? So this is saying, hey, I'm a foreigner, I'm certifying my foreign status, and, and, and here's some information on me. And it, it, there's... It's a little bit more involved of a form of a W-9. There's some stuff if you're going to be taking advantage of, let's say, reduced withholding weight rate uh, pursuant to a tax treaty. There's some information you need to fill out on form W-8-B-E-N. But that's beyond the scope of this video. What we're going to talk about is you need to provide this to payers within 30 days of your expatriation, okay? Um, and basically, who you're going to need to provide this to are the payers of amounts subject to withholding. So this is gonna be renters, like your brokerage account, because it's paying interest and dividends, potentially your bank, private corporations that you're a shareholder in. And this is to notify them that you are no longer a US person, you are now a foreign person. Uh, as a US person, when you get income, like interest and dividends and rent, uh, they're not subject to withholding, right? You get the entire amount, then you're liable for paying taxes on that. But as a foreigner, because the U.S. wants to guarantee that as a foreigner you actually pay the tax, those amounts are subject to withholding. So, for example, the default withholding rate is 30%. So let's say you're getting a dividend of 1000 bucks. If somebody has a Form W-8-B-E-N and, and the, the standard withholding rate is to apply, your brokerage, for example, is actually supposed to get that $700, or sorry, $1,000 dividend, withhold $300, give it to the IRS, and give you $700. But they need Form W-8-B-E-N to know you're a foreign person, that those rules apply. So uh, this, is, this is very important. The other advantage that this has, and normally your foreign banks are also going to require Form W-8-B-E-N, and that has the huge advantage of switching you from a U.S. person to a foreign person so FATCA does not apply and your accounts don't get reported to the United States, which is what you want. So this is the first sort of tax reporting requirement we're talking about. This you have to do within 30 days of your expatriation date. Now there's another form, which is Form WHCE. And this is a notice of expatriation and waiver of treaty benefits. This form only applies, one, to covered expatriates. And as you might know from my other videos, a covered expatriate is somebody with a net worth of $2 million or more, a net average income tax over the last five years of $171,000 or more, 
and and that is not tax compliant. And then you're a covered expatriate, and then you have all these fun exit tax rules that apply. Uh, it's a mark to, essentially a mark to market tax is if you'd sold everything you owned on, on the day before you expatriated. There's also some taxes on deferred compensation items, which we're gonna get into a little bit right now. Um, and there's some, some negative tax consequences, gift and estate tax consequences, which I'll also briefly touch on at the end of this presentation. But long story short, WHCE only applies to covered expatriates, and you only need to give it to payers of deferred compensation, specified tax deferred accounts, and if you and the trustee of a non-grant or trust of which you're a beneficiary. So I want to talk a little bit about what deferred compensation is. So an eligible deferred compensation item is Think SEP IRA, right? A self-employed person's IRA. An ineligible deferred compensation item is a foreign pension. Specified tax deferred account is a traditional IRA, uh, and a non-grantor trust is traditionally an, an irrevocable trust of which you're a beneficiary. Now, some of these items, you need to include their value in your taxable income in the year of expatriation. Others you don't have to include in your taxable income for the year of expatriation, but you do need to pay tax when you receive distributions. So for example, eligible deferred compensation items, uh, like a SEP IRA, you don't have to pay the tax until you actually get a distribution, but you have to waive your treaty benefits, so it is gonna be subject to 30% withholding. An ineligible tax deferred compensation item, you have to include the value in your taxable income for the year of expatriation. Same with tax, specified tax deferred accounts, so traditional IRAs. Non-grants or trusts are a little bit more similar to the eligible comp, uh, deferred compensation items in that you don't need to include the value of the non-grant or trust. And when you expatriate, you can if you want, but you don't have to. And if you don't, then there's gonna be a 30% withholding tax when you receive distributions because you have to waive those treaty benefits. So for the ones where you have to include the value in, in taxable income when you expatriate. So that's gonna be your ineligible tax deferred compensation items and your specified tax deferred accounts. You need to provide form WHCE to the payers within 30 days of your expatriation. They then have 60 days to give you the value uh, that you need to include, right? So those you have to provide the WHCE when you expatriate. For eligible deferred compensation items and non-grant or trusts, you can provide it prior to receiving the first distribution after expatriation. My advice though with all of these is if you're a covered expatriate and you have any of these, provide form WHCE to the payers immediately when you expatriate. That way it's done and you don't need to think about it anymore. I've seen situations where people have forgotten to do it, then a, a, a distribution is paid without the proper withholding, it's a nightmare to fix. So form WHCE, file it when you expatriate with, with payers of, of these items so you have it out of the way. So now let's talk income tax returns. So you have to file what is called a dual status income tax return for your year of expatriation. Now this is not filed in the year you expatriate, this is you file it with normal tax filing deadlines. So you file it, for example, if you expatriated in 2021, you would file your dual status tax return in 2022 for the year you expatriated being 2021. Now what a dual status tax return is in, for, for uh, somebody who expatriated is a 1040 NR, so a 1040 non-resident with a 1040, so a normal 1040 for US persons, attached to it as a schedule. And the way this works is the 1040 that's being attached as a schedule has the person's worldwide income included in it, right? Because as a U.S. person, you're liable for U.S. tax on your worldwide income. So the 1040 part of the return is, your, is for the part of the year you were a U.S. tax resident and it includes your worldwide income. That is then attached as a schedule to the 1040 NR and the 1040 NR would include everything from your 1040, so all the income that was on your 1040, plus any U.S. source income that would be subject to U.S. tax 
for the part of the year that you were a non-resident. So it's essentially two tax returns. One for the part of the year that you were a U.S. resident, uh, or U.S. tax resident, that includes your worldwide income, and a 1040NR for the part of the year that you were not a resident, that would include only your income subject to U.S. tax, plus all of the income from the 1040. It's a bit of a complex return, so when you're hiring somebody to prepare it for you, make sure they've done it before. I've seen a lot of people that are familiar with preparing, let's say, returns for Americans abroad, but this one throws them and they screw it up and you don't want to screw up your tax reporting for your year of expatriation. Now, in, if you continue to have U.S. income after you expatriate, you may still need to file a 1040NR. So if you have effectively connected income from the United States after you expatriate, you're still going to need to file a 1040NR for the years in which you have that income. Um, also, if you have income that was not fully withheld, then you'll need to file a tax return for that too. An example of that is, like I was saying earlier, normally you get a $1,000 dividend. As a foreigner, the payer withholds $300, gives it to the IRS, you get $700. In that scenario, it's fully withheld income. And if that was your only income, you're not going to be required to file a 1040NR because it's not required to be filed for income that was fully withheld. But if the payer, let's say, forgot to withhold that 300 bucks and gave you the whole thousand, then you would still need to file a 1040NR and, and pay that $300. Uh, now let's move on to form 8854, which is your initial and annual expatriation statement. Uh, this gets filed with your dual status tax return for the year that you expatriated. So not in the year you expatriated, Actually, the year after you expatriated, you file it with the dual status income tax return. This gives the IRS various information um, about you, when you became a U.S. citizen, when you expatriated, where you're living, your income, your assets, your net worth. It's a very important document to get correct. Um, so this is the original is sent with your dual status tax return and a copy is sent to another address at the IRS. If you're not required to file a tax return for the year that you expatriated, then you still need to file an 8854. This always needs to be filed. And the 8854 is where you must certify under penalty of perjury that you were tax compliant for the five years prior to expatriation. If you don't make this certification, then you are a covered expatriate and you are going to be subject to the exit tax and the cruel gift and estate tax rules, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. So this has to be filed for the year that you expatriated. Under certain circumstances, you need to file this in years subsequent to your expatriation. And that is, if for example, you had an eligible deferred compensation item like a SEP IRA and you, there's still money in it, then you need to file an 8854 annually to report that either you got no distributions or report the distributions that you did receive. Likewise, you need to report if you're a beneficiary of a non-grantor trust, you need to file 8854 annually to report that you either got no distributions or report the distributions. And finally, as, as I said, there is the possibility if you expatriate and you are a covered expatriate and you're subject to the mark-to-market tax, so basically this, this um, tax on the unrealized gain of your assets, that's sometimes difficult to pay without selling the asset, right? And so the IRS has a mechanism under which you can defer the payment of the tax until the, the selling of the property or, or other circumstances. When you do that, you need to file 8854 every year until that deferred tax and interest is paid in full, okay? so. As soon as you expatriate, you need to file within 30 days the W-8-B-E-N. If you're covered expatriate, the W-8-C-E as well. And then the year after you expatriated, but for the year of expatriation, you need to file your dual status tax return and your 8854. Now, this is not exactly a tax filing requirement, but it, it is a tax consequence of expatriation, so I, I wanted to touch on it briefly because it is important and it is something that is often missed. So, gift and estate taxes, and we're talking about U.S. gift and estate taxes. Generally speaking, it is the donor, so the person giving the gift, or the decedent's estate 
that is liable for the gift or estate tax. So if I'm an American and I give a gift, I'm liable for the gift tax. If I'm an American and I die, my estate is liable for the estate tax, right? So it's the transferor of whatever the property is that's liable for, for the estate tax. That is flip-flopped if you're a covered expatriate, meaning it is the U.S. person recipient who receives a gift or inheritance from a covered expatriate that is liable for the gift or estate tax at the highest gift or estate tax rate currently in effect, which is 40%. So that means if I get a gift of 100,000 from a covered expatriate, 15,000 of that is exempt because of the annual gift tax exclusion and 85,000 is gonna be subject to tax at 40%. That same calculation, um, except without the annual exclusion, is for estates as well. So if I inherit $100,000 from a covered expatriate, uh, I am liable for 40% estate tax on that. There are certain exclusions, so the annual gift tax exclusion, so this 15,000, so gifts of up to 15,000 from a covered expatriate are not subject to U.S. gift tax in the hands of the U.S. person recipient. Also, if the U.S. person recipient of the gift or inheritance is a U.S. charity or a U.S. citizen spouse, the, the marital deduction applies. You also don't have to uh, pay the tax. But any other person, for example, you're a covered expatriate and you give a gift or leave an inheritance to your kids who are U.S. persons, they're going to be li liable for gift and estate tax at the highest gift and estate tax rate that in effect and doing these gifts or inheritances through trusts and stuff like that also doesn't work because it's a direct or an indirect gift that is subject to this gift or estate tax. Now, one thing that's really important on top of this is that the burden on proving that the gift was not received from a covered expatriate is on the U.S. person recipient, right? So if I'm a U.S. person recipient of a gift from somebody I have to prove, I have the burden of proof vis-a-vis -vis the IRS that the person that gave it to me was not a covered expatriate. And if I can't prove it, I'm liable for the tax. So one of the things that we like to help all of our clients with who expatriate is put a package, or all of our clients that expatriate that are not covered expatriates, is to put a package together of certain expatriation documents evidencing that the person was not a covered expatriate. And then having that person give that package when they give a gift to somebody, right? That way they can prove that it was received from a non-covered expatriate, or for example, keeping it with their will or other estate planning documents that when they pass away and leave an inheritance to U.S. persons, that those U.S. persons receive evidence that they were not a covered expatriate and they did not receive that gift or inheritance from a covered expatriate, and they can then show that to the IRS as proof and avoid the gift or estate tax. So that is all I have for today. As always, if you need any help with expatriation planning or what the tax filing requirements are, Esquire Group's here to help. I hope you found this information useful and helpful, and we'll see you later.